Today, Colleen and I will be talking to you about cerebral blood flow. Blood flow to the brain is supplied by four main arteries. These are two carotids and two vertebral arteries. These vessels form the circle of Willis. The circle of Willis is a continuous network of vessels allowing collateral flow to all areas of the brain. As in the rest of the body, these large vessels bifurcate many times into smaller vessels capable of reaching all areas of the brain. These smaller vessels are called peel arteries and finally penetrating arterioles which penetrate the brain tissue via extensions into the subarachnoid space. This space is called the virtrorobin space. Small capillaries in this space allow exchange of oxygen, nutrients, carbon dioxide, and metabolites. This picture should look very familiar to you and it's important to not only be able to identify all the vessels but understand its ability to provide collateral flow during times of surgery or ischemia. It helps me to draw the circle of Willis and label them in the same way and same order every time and repeat it over and over in order to commit it to memory and I recommend that to you as well. First, I start with the three cerebral arteries, the anterior cerebral, middle cerebral, and posterior cerebral. Next, I label the communicating arteries between the cerebrals. First is the anterior and then the posterior communicating arteries. Next, I label the internal carotids and the ophthalmic arteries. Then, the top of the circle of Willis is finished. Next, I label the cerebellar arteries, the superior cerebellar artery, and then the anterior inferior cerebellar artery. Next is the basal artery, which is this long artery, and the branch off of it is the smaller group of pontine arteries. Then, at the very bottom, we have the vertebral artery. At this base of the picture, this is an artery that connects between the two vertebral arteries, and this is the spinal artery which, surprise, surprise, supplies blood flow to the spinal cord. And that is the down and dirty basics of the circle of Willis. Learn it, love it, and draw it over and over. A lot of my classmates invested in a small whiteboard to draw diagrams like this or formulas over and over again, and it worked really well for us. Just figure out a way that works for you and then continue drawing it that way. You will be asked to draw this in clinical. Here you see a network of blood vessels. We talked about on the last slide how the larger arteries bifurcate again and again until you have a network of vessels in the brain that somewhat resembles this. So just a pretty cool picture of what our brain's capable of doing. <clears throat> Alrighty, so on to the meat of this topic, which is cerebral blood flow. Normal blood flow to the brain occurs at a rate of approximately 50 to 60 milliliters per 100 grams of brain tissue per minute. This averages out to approximately 750 to 900 milliliters per minute. The brain is only a small portion of the total body weight, around 2%, but it demands 15% of the total cardiac output. Also, we will beat into our brains the idea that the brain is a sugar and oxygen hog. It will do basically whatever it needs to to ensure that the brain is continuously provided with these two things. The neuronal tissue of the brain consumes about seven and a half times the amount of glucose as compared to other non-neuronal tissues of the body. During times of excessive activity, the neuronal demand for glucose will increase 100 to 150 percent. Neuronal tissue also differs from non-neuronal tissue in the rest of the body in that it does not require insulin to get into glucose into the cell. Another big concept in cerebral blood flow is that it's coupled to metabolic demand. What this means is that metabolic demand increases in the brain. As metabolic demand increases in the brain, flow will increase to that specific area in order to provide it with enough oxygen and sugar to adequately meet its demands. Another way to think of this is that flow is directly related to the rate of metabolism. Blood flow regulation to the brain is controlled by four main things. Carbon dioxide concentration, hydrogen ion concentration, oxygen concentration, and different substances that are released from astrocytes within the brain that couple neuronal activity with local blood flow regulation. So I'm going to quickly go over each factor individually to show how cerebral blood flow is affected by it. First, CO2 concentration and hydrogen ion concentration work hand in hand. They are both acids that cause vasodilation of the cerebral vessels. Most simply put, an increase in CO2 concentration will increase cerebral blood flow. 
CO2 forms carbonic acid and then dissociates to form hydrogen ions. The hydrogen ions then cause vasodilation of the cerebral vessels. So again, the, an increase in hydrogen ions causes vasodilation of the cerebral vessels, increasing blood flow to that area. Now, since both these acids cause increased blood flow, this increased blood flow will then is then able to more quickly carry away the higher levels of these volatile acids, which will regulate the blood flow to a more normal level. So it's a constant balance of increasing and decreasing blood flow to the brain in order to maintain a homeostatic balance of CO2 and hydrogen ions. The next factor in cerebral blood flow is oxygen concentration. The brain consumes 3.5 mLs of oxygen per 100 grams of brain tissue per minute. When oxygen, oxygen delivery to the brain falls below this requirement, the cerebral vasculature dilates in order to allow for, for more blood flow to the brain to carry more oxygen to the deprived area. So again, a decrease in oxygen concentration will cause vasodilation, whereas an increase in both CO2 and hydrogen ion concentration will cause vasodilation of the cerebral vasculature. And this is a graph showing the CO2 and cerebral blood flow relationship. So again, as we just talked about, as CO2 increases, the vasculature will vasodilate to increase cerebral blood flow. And the same is true for hydrogen ion concentration. As you increase your hydrogen ion concentration, the vasculature will vasodilate to increase cerebral blood flow. And finally, the astrocyte substances. How this works, if there is more electrical activity in the brain, or in one area of the brain, or an increase in met uh, metabolism of nutrients, this will stimulate astrocytes to increase intracellular calcium, which as we know, calcium in equals neurotransmitter out. So we'll cause, this will cause vasodilation of nearby vessels, which will allow for more blood flow to the area that needs it. Also in this picture, you can see the penetrating arterial that comes through the virtual robin space and into the brain parenchyma. There are many astrocyte cells that are connected to various areas of the wall of the arterial that affect the vasodilation and vasoconstriction of these different areas. The blood flow can then be tailored to each individual small area that needs it. And <clears throat> this is a depiction of the different mechanisms within the brain that cause an increase in cerebral blood flow. It's just another way of showing the concepts we've just talked about. On the left, we have increased neurotransmitter release, like in the case of the astrocyte excitement causing increased calcium levels, which allows more neurotransmitter release and therefore has an increased metabolic demand. The middle is showing that the areas of the brain that are more active are consuming more ATP, which stimulates increased blood flow to the area. And finally, on the right side of, of the graph, showing our brain as an oxygen and sugar hog. So the more oxygen and glucose being consumed in one area will cause increased blood flow to that area as well. And finally, this is a graph that tends to pop up in different places, whether it be an A&P exam, C exam, impromptu questioning from one of our fearless leaders, you never know. This is a basic breakdown of the concepts we've already talked about, only in graph form. As we've learned today, the body has the ability to regulate flow in the brain in order to maintain a homeostatic state. The area in the middle of the graph, where the oxygen and cerebral perfusion remains constant, is called the area of autoregulation. For the most part, within normal pressures, a MAP of 50 to 150, or possibly 80 to 180 for hypertensive patients, the brain does exactly what we've been talking about today. Vasodilates or vasoconstricts according to what the brain needs. However, outside of this range, such as at very low blood pressures, which can happen at induction, with large fluid or blood losses, or any time we are not vigilantly monitoring our patients, the brain does not have the ability to autoregulate and enters what I like to call the swirl of death. Outside of these limits, the brain is not receiving the nutrients and oxygen it needs to survive, and so it will become ischemic. The main take-home point for this presentation is that there are many factors that go into the regulation of cerebral blood flow. Having a good understanding of these factors and how they interact with each other will prepare you for many clinical situations. Thank you for watching.